I think of myself as an absolutely normal human being who loves to explore, to see, to understand, to find out where I feel good, where other people feel good. I'm drawn to that. And I'm just a normal person. That's all. We all do the same thing. It's no more than allowing normal people to thrive. We were always going against the grain, so to speak. We had to do the interventions. That's where placemaking became such a powerful tool. Placemaking is incredibly humbling. People's minds to things and let them see it in their own way. So we're not looking at outcomes, forcing outcomes. We're setting outcomes that they define for themselves. And that's very comfortable. It's their future, and they, they will never remember who we are. My name is Fred Kent. I was born in 1942, on November 2nd, in Plainfield, New Jersey. I had free range. I delivered newspapers. We would be in small groups on bicycles. We'd go to the graveyards. We'd go to the downtown, small town life. You know, I was this young kid who really had no concept of what I couldn't do. It's kept me from getting trapped in a place where you can't get out. That's persisted through my entire life. I wanted to be in New York because this is where I, I knew I wanted to end up. New York City was a great place to be in because you couldn't be in yourself. The other good place to be in was in, the, in nature on the edge of the field because the edges of the fields are the most dynamic, environmental, the interesting areas. So if you can take a field and the edges of it, and you can take streets in New York, they are just full of life, you know, and just gives you life. You're giving it to it and you're getting from it at the same time. I was working at Citibank then, and we had these, this big urban crisis was really devastating. Crime was way, way up in drug dealing and all this stuff. I mean, it's environmental issues that were urban, but also natural. So people were trying to solve the problem. And, and my solution was to try to set up a school. In 1968, started a street academy program, ABLE Academy for Latin, Black and Latin Education, A-B-L-E. It was a school for more diversity of people coming together. You know, one of the people who funded it was uh, Mike Bloomberg in the bottom floor of an abandoned building. <laughs> so, and then we had something like 300 people uh, working to, to create uh, Earth Day. So this was Earth Day uh, in 1970. The, the subtitle here is The Whole World Joins In. Well, we had Fifth Avenue totally without cars, and it was amazing. The first day of spring, and it was a beautiful day, and we'd, uh, we'd asked to have Fifth Avenue closed. We didn't know what was going on on Fifth Avenue. Uh, but the next morning you wake up and you see this picture of Fifth Avenue totally swarming with people. And it was, a, it, was, it was a picture that went around the world. I think at that point, because it was sort of the beginning of the environmental movement, all these things were going on at the same time. We really, I began to call it the golden age of research and, and interest in, in community life and cities. Jane Jacobs, and there was Holly White. There were a whole bunch of people that were doing social life in communities. In 1971, we closed Madison Avenue for a week for, uh, to create a pedestrian mall. 
I set up the cameras to do observations. What do people do at, at an intersection? How life occurred at the street corner. You know, street corner, it's our very interesting places to observe. You know, Earth Day is, is not just about nature. It's about people. It's about the whole Earth. We've arrived at Bryant Park in the middle of New York City that became 40 years ago the heart of this district. And it is just blossoming every year. It kind of takes on a new level of energy. Bryant Park changed everything. It became the place where it was totally about programming. And programming, we learned, is about design but programming is also about improvisation. So you go and you see high levels of improvisation. The whole attitude was just make it neat, clean, and empty. The, the whole architecture profession became driven by fear and not, a lot, not wanting people to be using the public space. The world became more isolated. People were so afraid and their houses were disconnected. I mean, it was the dark ages of development over the last 50, 70 years where we really destroyed communities and downtowns. T towns just lost their whole reason for being uh, in many, many cases. We did the concept plan for Bryant Park. The entrance was not open very much. It was, the stairs were on the side. So you really couldn't, when you're looking from across the street or coming into it, it was not easy to see where you'd actually walk up. And once you walked up, you weren't connected to the, to the plaza in front of it. So uh, one of the recommendations that we made in the, was to open those stairs up. At that time, you, what we were looking at was drug dealing and how it just was pervasive. And the, and the reason that we, you could easily see that you needed to open it up, then the visibility coming into the park would in a sense begin to control or limit the drug use. You started displacing drug dealing with so-called legitimate uh, activities. To replace drug dealing with coffee and ice cream is, is not a hard sell. So you've shifted the culture. If you plan your cities for cars and traffic, you get more cars and traffic. If you plan it for people and places, you get more people and places. I started Project for Public Spaces in 1975, and we had offices in Rockefeller Center. Well, we, we had been working in the Rockefeller family offices, but we were given space here to open our PPS. Steve Davies was an architect and he uh, was, he's brilliant. He was a good writer. He was, he could understand things very well. He could help organize and manage a lot of the project work that we did. Kathy Madden is a godsend for us because when she thinks of design, she thinks of how something works. She didn't see design as object or art. She saw it as how it really would bring people's lives together in these places. So that you can always come and there's something fresh every time you come. And did some of the most beautiful flowers and seasonal things. It was really fascinating because uh, we ended up not only studying, but we ended up making simple recommendations that they would actually implement. Everything we did was based on 
findings of studying a plaza, taking uh, time lapse, uh, observing characters. I mean, it was all, we were woven right into that. So we were always going against the grain, so to speak. And, and so uh, we had to do the interventions. That's where placemaking became such a powerful tool because, and we had to do lighter, quicker, cheaper interventions to show people that there's a different route, a whole different mode of, of improvisation. And what you're now setting up is the fact that people know this. They know what makes it better, and they will actually take it and make it better for themselves. It's powerful and seductive and, and replicable. When we first came here, there was absolutely nothing to do except lie in the grass. And then about 20 years ago, we came up with this idea of the power of 10, that a great space needs 10 places. In each of those places, you need 10 things to do. I mean, just imagine going back and all of a sudden opening your eyes and seeing this. We did a placemaking vision. So we were doing this exercise, the place game, with uh, the board of a museum and local artist organizations and so on. And head of a museum asked me, uh, well, how many places do we need inside and outside? And, and I, I had no idea. So I said 10. And then she said, well, how many activities do we need in each of those places? And I didn't know what to say. So I said 10. So 10 times 10 times 10. And if you go to Ryan Park uh, today, they have 20 places where there are 10 things to do. And so, I mean, they've gone to an extreme in a very good way that you can't go in there and not see so many things to do that you will stay many, many times more than you thought you would stay when you came. You know, I remember it because we would work on specific places like Detroit. It didn't require a lot of planning, it just required doing. With a beach at the center, at the heart of Detroit. And that's improvisation, that's creativity, that's local ownership. Uh, the beach was absolutely extraordinary. Imagine putting a beach in a city as depressed as Detroit, and people would come, all kinds of people would come and play in that beach and around it for, with a beer garden. It's a big shift. So if you look at it, you can see the power of 10. Oh, hi. What are we doing? <laughs> well, I, we're just looking for some of our really special photographs and then just enjoying looking at them again. again. Uh, these are our people we've worked together for over 45, 45 years. Kathy Madden and Steve Davies. And uh, we've accomplished the most amazing way beyond any one of what one of us could do together we've kind of created this kind of outcome that uh, we could never have expected if we hadn't there look at that oh kathy my long-term colleagues and friends and neighbors right <laughs> <laughs> yeah this is one of our great pictures these are guys hanging out on the street. You know, and these are mobile, and, you, and if you've watched a place like this for a while and take pictures, you get to see all kinds of ways that people do it to get ice cream. Now, one of the great organizers or attractions is ice cream. Uh, so if you want to see a place with activity, start with ice cream. The, the problem is we've de been defined for the last 70 years by professions. And those professions, we say that each discipline has become its own audience. And they build their capacity, they build their agendas, they build strategies for implementing their agendas. If architecture is frozen music and planning is composition, 
placemaking is improvisational street performance. And so the whole idea of placemaking is about community doing the work to create their future. It isn't about professionals. They have to go into the background, be resources, but the real outcome is going to be defined by that improvisation and social life that people just glom onto. The cities have to be reborn, really, for the most part. I mean, they've failed in so many levels, and not just the cities, but the suburbs, probably even more so. So we really need a, a, a global transformation, and that transformation, if it's done around places and placemaking, it'll save the planet. It'll, it'll have a big impact on climate. It'll have a big impact on politics and democracy without any hesitation. Placemaking is the most basic idea of people on this planet helping to make their community, their lives better. So changing planning, changing architectures, changing transportation uh, are fundamental ways of shifting. And then creating squares and markets uh, are what open people up to far broader opportunities. We used to say in all of our presentations uh, is we need to turn everything upside down to get it right side up. And then we would say to get from inadequate to extraordinary. So in a way, we're bringing people from a lot, a lot of parts of our lives actually. Here, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we have links with so many different people on different parts of the world and stuff. You know, it's wonderful. In a sense, that's what placemaking is. We were just talking about how placemaking people are generally multinational, multi-layered. Uh, and so in a sense, whenever you get together, you're actually sort of reaching out into many different ways of living or types of living or parts of the world. Kind of cool. You don't feel like you're in a little tunnel of the same people talking to the same. It's a good way to live. I think that's why we all are involved in this, in this sort of simple idea that people and places are important. It's been a great journey, hasn't it, for all of us. It's really wonderful. So you took a project of three years. I made a project of 50, <laughs> 50 years. Yeah. Right, and we're still, not, we're still not there. I mean, I don't know what the next, well, the next evolution of this thing is the whole concept that uh, it's about a global transformation.